Tonight, our topic is bibliology. Now, what I've elected to do is when we get into the topic of bibliology, sufficiency, inerrancy, uh, authority, all of the stuff that is categorized underneath the theology of bibliology, what I thought I would spend time doing tonight is first giving you an introduction to systematic theology. Dr. Marsh has referenced this several times. He spent one night giving you a pretty robust definition of biblical theology, which we'll revisit a little bit tonight. But on our quest to understanding bibliology, we need to have a prolegomena. We need to first understand what systematic theology is and why systematic theology is important and why we all need to know systematic theology, Christian systematic theology, conservative uh, biblical um, uh, bibliology. As R.C. Sproul once said, everyone's a theologian. Everyone in this room is a theologian. The question is not, are you a theologian? The question is, are you a good theologian? Unfortunately, uh, biblical illiteracy runs rampant in evangelicalism, and although all Christians are theologians, most Christians in America are not good theologians, which is really to our shame, because there is no more place in the world where theology is more developed than in the English language here in America. So let's do an introduction to systematic theology, and we'll begin with, um, first of all, what is theology? What is theology? You'll have an outline here in front of you tonight as we kind of work through these. This outline isn't going to contain everything. If you want a copy of my notes, I'd be happy to give them to you. Just email me afterwards or come see me. But let's begin then with what is theology? Well, theology is a combination of two Greek words. We'll start with the definition. The first word is theos, which means God, and the second word is logia, or the noun form logos, which means words or ideas. So the word theology is words about God or ideas about God. If you've ever had a conversation with someone Regarding God, whether that person is an unbeliever or a believer, you have uh, entered into the realm of theology. So you are a theologian. A theologian is someone who speaks words about God. If you've talked to your kids about theology, you're a theologian. If you've evangelized people, you're a theologian. Unbelievers who are trying to figure out who God is, they're engaging in theology. They are theologians as well. That doesn't mean they're good theologians, but they're engaging in the act of theology. Now let's talk about sources of theology. There are right sources of theology and there are wrong sources of theology. What are some wrong sources of theology? Let me give you six of them. You can write this down if you're taking notes. First, tradition. Tradition. Church tradition is not an acceptable source of theology. And we're going to talk about why that is a little bit more tonight. Second, experience. I get this one a lot. Uh, There's an older gentleman that I converse with on a regular basis. He's 85 years old, very successful in the eyes of the world, made millions and millions and millions of dollars. And every time he and I get in a conversation about theology, he says to me, well, Ryan, my experience teaches me dot, dot, dot. And then he makes a theological statement. This is why age does not make you a good theologian. This is why you can meet people that have said, I've been a Christian for 20, 30, 40 years And they still have some really skewed views of who God is. Experience or age does not, is not a valid source of healthy theology. Third, mysticism. And what is mysticism? Personal revelation. God spoke to me. God told me. If you use that language or you're running into people that use that language, you're a mystic. It's the technical definition of the word. 
feeling like or thinking that God is directly speaking to you ex cathedra, that is outside the Bible, makes you a mystic. And mysticism is not a valid source of theology. Tradition, experience, mysticism, intuition. We use that one a lot, don't we? Well, I feel like this is what I'm supposed to. Now, let me just tell you, I think you're probably in the same boat that I'm in. I felt like doing a whole lot of things in my life, and a lot of things that I felt like doing weren't the right thing. You know what I'm talking about? Can I get an amen? Amen. Intuition is not, but listen, as a pastor, I get this all the time. Pastor Ryan, I'm just calling you to let you know this is what I have decided to do. Tell me why you decided to do that. Well, because I just feel like it's the right thing, and I prayed about it. By the way, that is the defense when someone's using intuition to make theological conclusions, is I prayed about it. Because what you're really saying is I prayed about it, and God spoke to me ex cathedra. So you're also a mystic. Those are not valid ways to come to accurate conclusions about who God is, what God wants, and what he's calling you to do. So the topic of systematic theology is so helpful in painting a picture to us about who God is, what he's doing in the world, and what he wants us to do. Fourth, rationalism. Rationalism. God is logical. God is rational. But rationalism, apart from divine revelation, is not a valid form of theology. And this kind of goes in line with intuition is emotion. I got to speed up. I'm not even a fourth of a way through my first page, and I have 20 pages. So what are right sources of theology? What are right sources of theology? We looked at the wrong sources. Let's look at the right sources. The right sources of theology are twofold. Um, Now, backing up a little bit, and I'm going to unpack this a little bit more, if time permits, When we ask, when we talk about bibliology, we're talking about what the Bible says about itself. Does that make sense? So on our quest to understand scripture, we want to ask the question, what does the Bible say about itself? That's the topic of bibliology. So when we ask what right sources of revelation are, we're going to the Bible and we're saying, hey, Bible, What are right sources of theology? And there's only two. And you probably know them because you guys are well taught. And what are they? They are, number one, general revelation. General revelation. Let's just seat this in our minds firmly. Turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, then you'll get to Romans. Romans chapter 1, Paul is giving an indictment of all humanity, saying why everybody deserves the wrath of God. Romans chapter 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Why? Notice the purpose clause. Because, the reason, because, That which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them, for, the conjunction for, connects verse 20 to verse 19, since the creation of the world, since the beginning of time, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen. How? Notice the text. Being understood through what has been what? Made. Made. Creation. When you look at a sunset and you think, man, God is a beautiful creator. That's you recognizing his glory being revealed through creation. General revelation is God's glory being revealed through creation. We can go a million different places to to see that in scripture. Second, right source is not only general revelation, but class second, And you guys are special. This is great. It's true. Special revelation. Special revelation means God's divine revelation. You can know the character of God through general revelation, 
but you cannot know specifics about God through general revelation. Let me give you an example. Now, if you did not know me and you came into this room and you saw me at a distance, you are seeing me with your eyes and you are perceiving me with your ears. So you're making conclusions about who I am through what you perceive. Is that correct? So uh, you are learning things about me. But it's very different to come over to my house and sit in my living room with my wife and I and talk about the particulars of our lives. There's a lot you wouldn't know about me if you didn't come over and have a conversation about the particulars. You see what I'm saying? Special revelation is the particulars, if you would, about who God is, what he's doing in the world, and how he saves people. And there are things in general revelation that we cannot know, that general revelation does not show us, only special revelation shows us. The biggest one is salvation. Creation shows us there is a God, but creation doesn't specifically reveal God's plan of redemption through his son, Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? So special revelation is the particulars. It's the written word of God. All right, let's move on. Stay with me. Don't lose me. Or don't let me lose you. Corey, Pastor Corey loses me every Sunday morning, so. I'm glad some of you laughed at that. That was good. Okay, introduction to systematic theology. So we asked, what is theology? What are some valid sources of theology? But when we talk about systematic theology. And we'll get to the definition of systematic in a little bit. Remember, we're talking about theology, words about God. There is a presupposition. And that is that God can be known. On Sunday, as I was preaching, uh, a guy came up to me afterwards. He was weeping uncontrollably after the sermon. I think he was converted in his chair. I think the Lord saved him on Sunday. And he came up to me and he said to me, I understand now. I can know God through Jesus Christ. It's like, you got it. See, the presupposition of Christian systematic theology is that we can know God. We can know him. And we can know him truly and really. The knowability of God. Let's just go through some things on the knowability of God, just some general statements. I'm gonna brush through this really, really quick because there's some other stuff that I wanna get to. But when we talk about the, the knowability of God, here's what one theologian says. He says that if we are to know God at all, it is necessary that God reveal himself to us. And God has. God has revealed himself to us through numerous means, including the natural world, miracles, and most significantly through his written and his incarnate word. Now, when God chooses to reveal himself to us, um, we need to understand some things about God's revelation. God's revelation about himself is, has three categories. So we don't have time to get into all these, but this is, it's sufficient to say that everything God says about himself is true, is accurate, and trustworthy. God can only reveal things that are true about himself. He cannot lie. Titus 1.2 says that God never lies. Hebrews 6.18 says that it is an impossibility for God to lie. We can know God. Everything God says about himself is true. It's also accurate. We can know him accurately, and everything that he says should be trusted because he is fully trustworthy. Now, there's a lot that we can say on the topic of the knowability of God, but for the sake of time, we need to move on. Again, literally every subpoint we can dive deeper and deeper and deeper I'm trying to give you an overview on systematic theology before we get into biblical theology. So just understand, look at the outline, follow the thinking, follow the reasoning. How can I know true things about God? Answer, I am going to look into the things that, or the ways in which God says he reveals himself, i.e. his word. And as I do that, his word tells me that he is knowable and that he never lies. He is true, he is accurate, and he is trustworthy. Now, although God is knowable, this is what frustrates a lot of Christians. You need to understand this on your quest to being a good theologian. If I were to sit down and have a conversation with you about supra-infralapsarianism or infralapsarianism, you would probably all fall asleep. Not only would you fall asleep when we got into the subject of infralapsarianism, 
our minds would also spin in trying to grasp the infinite, and we would probably leave that conversation feeling dizzy and like we had no concrete answers. One of the things that you need to understand as a Christian is that God, although imminent, meaning he is close, he is near, he is also incomprehensible. And if you are not comfortable with mystery, you will never have a comfortable relationship with God. As we'll note in a moment, God fully knows us, but you will never, ever fully know him. That is because he is the infinite. He is incomprehensible. Listen to what Psalm 145.3 says. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. The Bible is simple, and we'll talk about this when we talk about the clarity or perspicuity of Scripture. It's a plain book. It's a book that children can understand. But as we search into the divine, it's also a book that satisfies the greatest intellect because God is incomprehensible. His greatness is unsearchable. God is knowable, but he is incomprehensible. Turn with me to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Now, this is why I want you to do this, is we're thinking about this idea of God being incomprehensible. We need to understand the creature and creation distinction. Are you incomprehensible? The answer is, now husbands, I know what you're thinking. I cannot figure my wife out. You can. First Peter 3 says that we are to dwell with our wives with what? In an understanding way. This idea that uh, men cannot understand women is foreign to the Bible. In fact, the Bible calls men to be learners of their wives. So it's incompatible to say that we cannot learn about people or ourselves because that's a statement of saying we are incomprehensible. Man, it's a cop-out. Because your wife is not incomprehensible. She is comprehensible, and God wants you to comprehend her. So I've erased from my vernacular that phrase or that statement. Allison, I cannot understand you, woman. I will still say it tongue-in-cheek, but I remember, and she reminds me that, Ryan, you are to learn me and to know me. Now, part of this is rooted in that creature-creator distinction. What I'm trying to help you understand as we progress in our understanding of who God is, as we become better theologians, the tension that exists is the tension between God's imminency, his closeness, and his incomprehensibleness. So yes, we're going to get great answers as we study theology, but we will always have a sense of dealing with mystery because we're dealing with the incomprehensible. The Bible helps us by putting us in our place a little bit. Psalm 139. And I'll just read you verses 1 through 16. I know it's a lot. I have no idea how I'm going to get through this lecture, but we'll see how it goes. Here it comes. Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and you what? Know me. You know when I sit down. You know when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down. You are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before, and you laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you for you form my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unborn substance and in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me. Yet, uh, when as yet there was none of them. What an incredible statement of God's omniscience 
an understanding of who we are. God knows you. And by the way, it's here in the Psalms because it's meant to be a comforting thing in Psalm 139. You can go back and read the entirety of Psalm 139. As a side note, you'll hear me quote the Psalms a lot when we talk about theology. You'll hear theologians quote the Psalms a lot. Theology is always to be doxological. Anybody know what that is? Doxological. Doxology. What's doxology? It's praise and worship. When you rightly see who God is, it naturally leads to what? You have a worship problem? You have a theology problem. Your worship only rises as high as your theology. So through the Psalms, what you see is a celebration, singing, of who God is and what He has done. So uh, you want to know God better? Read the Psalms. It'll warm your heart because it's from a devotional perspective. It's celebrating who God is is. All right. God is knowable, yet he's incomprehensible. And it's important to understand too, and uh, we don't have time for this, so I'm going to skip over it, but it's important to understand that man was created to know God. Man was created to know God. Remember when God created uh, Adam, Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. Adam and Eve sinned, and God removed them from his presence because of what? Sin. In who we are created to be, we are created to be a people that have a relationship with God. We don't have time to get into the biblical anthropology of that, but uh, let's move on um, to the next topic. So notice this screen here. What is theology? So we're still on our topic, introduction to systematic theology. We've defined theology. We've talked about right and wrong sources of theology. We've made the statement that God is knowable. I want to just drill down a little bit into... I'm editing on the fly. We're going to skip this section for the sake of time. Next, we're going to look at Revelation, and we already looked at general Revelation and special Revelation. We're going to take a deeper dive into it, but let's talk about written Revelation. Now, when we look at um, special Revelation, there are two kinds of special Revelation. Can anybody tell me what that is? So remember, general revelation is God what? Reveals himself. And in general revelation, God reveals himself through his what? Creation. Creation. In special revelation, God reveals himself primarily in two ways. What are those? The word of God, God, scriptures, and Jesus. Jesus is what? The Logos. The Logos. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then 1 John 1.14 says, and the Word became flesh, and what? Dwelt among us. Special revelation is the Logos of God, but the Logos of God is in two forms. Written form, and He came incarnate. Jesus is the Word of God. Meaning, John 4 says, God is spirit, And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Is God the Father a spirit? Yes, Yes, John 4. God is spirit, reference to God the Father. How can we, finite created beings, know and interact with a God who is a spirit? And we are separated from him by sin. Answer, we cannot... Unless God chooses to reveal himself to us. God has chosen to reveal himself to us in the past through prophets and in these last days, according to Hebrews 1, in his what? Son. In fact, let's hammer this because I can't help myself. Turn to Hebrews 1. Turn to Hebrews 1. This is so important. I can't say this enough. I can't say it's strong enough. I can't say it enough for your own joy and our clarity in the truth. This is so important to understand. Let me back up a little bit. When the Bible uses the phrase, well, let's ask you the question. When you use the phrase, word of God, what do you mean? 
kind of like it. But is that precise language? When I call the Bible the Word of God, is that a true statement? Yes. But is that a precise statement? Well, when you go through the Bible, if you were to take that phrase, the Word of God, and you were to list all of the ways that that phrase is used, you would discover that the phrase Word of God is used seven to nine different ways in the Bible. For example, when God spoke to Moses through the burning bush, was that God's word? Yes, but it was God's audible, what? Word. Scripture comes from a Hebrew, or I'm sorry, a Greek word, graphia, which refers to written language. So what is God's written word? Well, the technical term used in the Bible for God's written word is scripture. God's word has many forms in the Bible. But when we talk about scripture, we're talking about the written form of God's word. Are you with me? When Jesus came as God incarnate, was there a New Testament? No. There was not. But yet, in the New Testament, Paul calls Peter, Peter calls Paul's writings Scripture. And there's several instances in the New Testament where apostles are calling other writings in the New Testament that we would call the, the New Testament Scripture. So the New Testament was not written when Jesus came, right? But Jesus, God incarnate, the divine Logos, but the, the, the disciples, who later became the apostles, wrote everything down about Jesus that they saw, and then they taught didactically the, the truth of Jesus ironed out in the epistles. Are you with me? Are you thinking with me here a little bit? And here's why this is important. Because when you say, now listen to me, and let me, let me try to be charitable and clear. God spoke to me. No, he didn't. He didn't. And I'm going to prove it to you right now. But I want you to think with me logically. If you say, God spoke to me, if you mean, I think God wants me to do this, well, that's okay. I'll give you that. But I like the language, I think it's best. In fact, you see the Apostle Paul using that language in the book of Acts to do different things that he thought God called him to do, he actually says, and you can look this up in the book of Acts, it seemed best to me. Why did the Apostle Paul use that language? Because the Apostle Paul knew something. The Apostle Paul knew that God does not speak, what? Ex cathedra, outside of Scripture. By the way, there's an entire false, um, there's an entire false religion built on God speaking outside the Bible. Well, there's a lot of those, but there's a really big one, and 26% of the people in San Juan Capistrano are attached to it, the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church says that the Pope can speak infallibility ex cathedra outside of the scriptures. That's why when the Pope comes out and says a crazy statement like you're not allowed to do this, Roman Catholics have to obey it because in their catechisms, he can speak ex cathedra. But when we, are, when we say God spoke to me as evangelicals, we're doing the same thing. Because we're saying that I have an impression, I have an intuition, I have something that's telling me this is what God wants me to do. Now, do you have the Holy Spirit inside of you? Yes. yes. But the Holy Spirit is Christocentric. And the Bible is Christocentric. The Holy Spirit's job is to point you to Christ. Does that make sense? Is the Holy Spirit who is God, ever going to speak apart or against his word? He is not. So as you hide the word of God in your heart, the Holy Spirit's going to use, so you come every Sunday, you're reading your Bible on your own, you're doing devotionals, you're in the word, you're seeking God, the Holy Spirit's going to use all of that. But don't confuse that. There's a Bible teacher I like named Steve Lawson. He says, God will never bring anything out of here until you first put it in here. It's important to understand that God speaks through his word. Okay, let's get into Hebrews. Look at the text. Notice Hebrews chapter one. God, after he spoke, important language, long ago. How did he speak long ago? It's in the Old Testament. To the fathers, 
patriarchs, in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways. So in other words, you go back in the Old Testament, God spoke to the fathers through the prophets or in the prophets and in many different ways. I mean, he even used a donkey at one time, right? I mean, he did all kinds of stuff to speak to people in the Old Testament. In these last days, look at verse two, what's that? What's these last days? The age of the church. The age of the church. In these last days has spoken to us in his what? Whom he appointed heir of all things through whom he also made the world. In these last days, God has spoken through his son. But wait a minute, this creates a problem because Jesus isn't here. He's not. There are false teachers that will tell you that Jesus appears to them in their bedrooms and he says all kinds of things to them. But I'll tell you where Jesus is right now. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he's in a physical body. He is resurrected and ascended and seated at the right hand of the Father. But in these last days, God only speaks to us through his what? Son. So how does he speak through his son? Answer, through the teaching of the what? The word. The specifically, precise language, the apostles. Turn to Acts 2.42. Real quick, this was not in my notes, Uh, but this is so important to understand. Do you understand what I'm saying when I, does God speak to us today? Yes, but through his what? Where the Holy Spirit used that internally, oftentimes I'll feel like God is calling me to do something. Now is that, oh man, this is not in my notes, so if I sound crazy, I'm all over the place, it's because I am. Okay, listen. What's the difference between objective truth and subjective truth? Subjective is mind dependent, objective. Subjective is mind dependent, and objective is concrete. Let's say that fact. If I drop this microphone right now, is it going to fall to the floor? Yeah. Is that objective or subjective? Objective. objective. It's, it's, it's going to happen. It's a fact, it's reality. Yeah. Blue bubblegum ice cream is the best ice cream in the world. Yeah, that's objective truth. Is that subjective or objective? So if I feel like God is calling me to do something because I've hid the word of God in my heart and I feel like the Holy Spirit's leading me to do that, is that objective or subjective? Subjective. 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 It could be true and it could not be true. Because I'm in Christ, John MacArthur says, I don't know where he begins and I end. Oftentimes, if you step in faith, when you feel like God is calling you to do something, you find out, wow, that was God. He did something incredible. I moved in faith. I I thought that he was telling me to do. But that's okay. What's not okay is when we try to tell people objective realities based on subjective feelings. Do you understand? Pastor Ryan, I'm going to do this. Why? Because God told me. You just took a subjective impression and you made it an objective reality. That's a sign. It's not from God. Because you're trying to make something that's subjective, objective. God doesn't do that. God has given us objective truth, and his objective truth is what? His word. Two things, the logos, incarnate, that is Christ, and the written graphe, the scriptures, the word of God. So we hide the word of God in our heart that we might not sin against him. Does that make sense? Are you with me? And we're transformed by the mercies of God, by the renewing of our mind through the word of God. So do you understand what I'm talking about? This whole language of God told me? If what you mean is I have a subjective impression, that's okay. But if what you mean is this is objectively real, that's not okay. It's probably not from God. But Christians do that all the time And they wreck their lives and get themselves spun up and hurt because they're doing things based on subjective feelings and not on the objective truth of God's word. Amen, are you with me? But objective truth demands submission. Objective truth demands submission because God's word is authoritative. We'll get to there. Well, we might get there. I'll just trust this was a helpful night, however it goes. All right, here we go. The written word of God 
In these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. The word spoken tells us that God's truth is propositional. So propositional truth, let me explain what that is. Propositional statement is a statement that affirms or denies something. It expresses something about someone or something that can be evaluated or understood. Did you hear that? A propositional truth affirms or denies something, expresses something about someone or something that can be evaluated or understood. God's word is a propositional truth. Now, why is this so important? Part of what we're talking about in biblical literacy is the whole first half of this book is full of cults. And what happens to people that don't understand that God's word is propositional truth. Propositional truth it affirms or denies, expresses something that can be evaluated and understood. So if, you're, if, if someone comes to you and says, I'm Jesus incarnate, you need to do what I say. Because this book's full of false teachers that did that. And First John tells us there will be many antichrists and many who claim to be Christ, right? How do you then deal with that statement on our quest for biblical literacy? How do we point out false teachers? Because the written word is propositional truth. It has to be something that can be evaluated. That's part of what a propositional truth is. When someone has a subjective impression and says something without objective graphia, it's not a propositional truth because it cannot be evaluated. Does that make sense? That one phrase, God's word is propositional truth, will help greatly in aiding biblical literacy and people not getting swept up in cults. Should you do whatever I say? No. Wait a minute. I am the pastor of this church. And the Bible says that you have to obey your leaders and submit to them for they watch over your souls. Don't you have to do whatever I say? No. Because why? <laughs> yeah, <I was> like, <laughs> hey, but this is a well-taught church and that's right. Because I do not possess in myself any authority over you. None whatsoever. I have zero authority over you. What has authority over you? The word of God. And it's the shepherd's job to teach God's people the word and the word can be evaluated. I'm not listening to Ryan. I'm not listening to elders. I'm listening to God's word. Understanding that God communicates his word and propositional truths will help you be, avoid being spiritually abused. Does that make sense? But how many Christians don't understand this? And so a pastor comes to them and says, you have to do this. And they do it and they think, I have to do it. He's a pastor. Well, see, the problem is, is that pastor hasn't rightly taught the source of authority. It's not him. And it's not the elders. We have a authority of stewardship, meaning we tell you to obey God's word, but we never ask you to obey subjective things. And if we do, run, leave the church, never come back. Amen? Not just our church, any church. It's an abuse. All right. None of that was in my notes. Not only is God's written revelation propositional, it's personal. This is all helping us with our bibliology. You're like, I have no idea how. Let me explain. When we're preparing to understand bibliology right, meaning the word of God and how we interact with God, it's important to understand that God wants us to understand his words and he wants us to evaluate his words, but he also wants us to take it personal. God's word is personal. The written revelation of God is personal. Now, the Bible is not written directly to us, and so we need to understand hermeneutics. We'll talk about that in a minute. Dr. Marsh talked about that in detail last week. But it's important to understand that God's written word is personal. Okay, here we go. Systematic theology defined. Now, pop quiz. Let's see if... uh, Who am I going to call on? Who am I going to pick on? I've seen a couple of you bobbing for apples. Let's go with Sarah Conroy. Sarah's like, ah, why did he have to choose me? Sarah, what does the word theology mean? The study of God. The study of God, right? Two, com- combination of two Greek words, logos and theo, the study of God, or words about God. So what is systematic theology? Systematic theology is the logical, coherent, comprehensive organization 
of the teaching of scripture into various divisions of theology. Once again, the logical, coherent, comprehensive organization of the teaching of scripture into various divisions of theology. So this takes us into theological methodology. Now, we don't have time for this. We do a little bit, so I'm going to do a little bit. When we talk about systematic theology, systematics, there is a theological method to the organization of systematics. There are not, or 10, we'll talk about them in a minute, categories for systematic theology. But how do we arrive at systematic theology? Now you've seen Dr. Marsh, or you've heard him refer to several of these things before, but I'd like to just reiterate them to you. So this is a, this is a think of this as a house. These are you, where your building blocks are. So you go into my office, I, have, I think I have 5,000 books on my computer, and I think I have about 1,000 books on the shelves in my office. And if you go to my systematic theology shelf, you're going to see a book called Systematic Theology by one author, and then right next to it, you're going to see another book called the same thing, Systematic Theology by another author, and you're going to have 10 different books on systematic theology. But what's the problem with just reading systematic theology? Well, notice you've skipped how many steps? I can't, I'm, not, I'm not a math guy. Four? So this is a house. I want to teach you how this works. Corey has alluded to it in this series, but this is how this works. So we begin with the presupposition that the Bible is complete. That's the canon of scripture. The Bible as we have it, the 66 books written by 44 different authors, this is God's complete word. That's the topic of uh, canicity. And we're not gonna get into canicity or canonicity right now so much. Even though it's in my notes, we won't have time to get to it, okay? Once we begin with the presupposition that this is a closed collection, there's nothing to be added, there's nothing to be taken away, this is the word of God, my next step is to interpret it. And that is hermeneutics, okay? So systematic theology stands upon uh, canonicity, then hermeneutics. And we've talked a lot about hermeneutics. Anybody tell me what hermeneutics means from last week? Can they tell me what it was named after? Hermes, Hermes, the Greek god of Hermes, because he was the god of the Greeks that interpreted things from Zeus and the other gods, right? So hermeneutics is the science and art of interpretation. And we talked about a literal, historical, grammatical hermeneutic. How do you get to the right interpretation? Well, we want, what are we after in interpreting? the author's original meaning. So when we read the Bible, are we after, what is God saying to me? No, No, you shouldn't be because then you'll miss the meaning. I I wasn't alive back then. This wasn't written to me. So I'm reading Ephesians. Who wrote it? Paul. Paul. So I'm after whose meaning? Paul's. I'm after Paul's intended meaning. And I need to understand something of the history to get there. I need to understand who he's writing to. He's writing to the church in Ephesus. But I also need to understand some of the language. And this is where pastors go to school to learn Hebrew and Greek. So we understand things like grammar and syntax and, uh, and all that's involved in grammar, the meaning of words and all that good stuff. So to get the author's original meaning, I need history and grammar. Literal, historical, grammatical, hermeneutic. Okay, we repeat that all the time. On top of that, we get to exegesis. Who can tell me what exegesis is? You're not taking our idea and putting, find it in another view. Yeah, Vicky. Yeah. That's eisegesis. That's the wrong one. Yep. Not Jesus like that, but it's spelled similar to this. Eisegesis is when you insert your own thinking into the text. Exegesis is when you're exiting the ideas out of the text. One author said it this way, the process of careful analytical study of the Bible to produce useful interpretations of those passages. The word exegesis comes from the Greek term uh, exogeomai, which means to explain or to narrate or to show the way. So at our church, we're committed to expository, what? Preaching. Preaching. What does that mean? What does it mean to say that we are dogmatically, that we are bulldogmatically committed to expository preaching. 
we are bulldog committed to explaining the text. That's what expository preaching means. We like to say, we want the Bible to use us to preach its message. We don't want to use the Bible to preach what? Our message. We want to be exegetes. But if I'm going to have proper exegesis, I have to have first two foundational things in place. I have to have a sound hermeneutic and I have to have the presupposition that the Bible is the complete word of God. Does that make sense? After I exegete a text, I come to biblical theology. Who can remind me what Dr. Marsh said about biblical theology? Here's what biblical theology is. The organization of scripture thematically by biblical chronology or by a biblical author with respect to the progressive revelation of the Bible. Did you understand any of that? I've been doing this long enough where I just forget that nobody knows what all this stuff means. So let me unpack it for you a little bit. Systematic theology is when we go through the whole Bible and we categorize what the whole Bible says about a given topic. And we'll point this out in just a minute. Biblical theology is organizing a theme with regard to progressive revelation. What's progressive revelation? Progressive revelation is that God did not reveal himself, his plan of salvation, or his plan for eternity all in one moment. Did he? Did he snap his fingers and the Bible fell out of the sky? Came down on a golden cloud. Ah. If that was the case, God's word would not be progressive. It would not have been revealed progressively for history, but God's word was written over a period of 1,500 years. So God has revealed himself and his plan of redemption to us, what? Progressively. So what biblical theology does is you'll hear things in scholarship like Pauline theology. Have you ever heard that? Or maybe Dr. Marsh, he's a Johannian scholar, which means that he's all, he's like microscoping like all the little details about John. So he's really concerned with what did John mean by this at the exclusion of Peter and Paul? Because he is a biblical theologian. Meaning he's not concerned with systematics, what the whole Bible says about a given topic. He's zooming in on a particular topic and noting how that topic shifts over time. For example, the word gospel we use that word all the time, right? Now, the word gospel means good news. But did you know originally that the word gospel was actually a word that was used by, to describe an emissary that would bring good news from a, an, a Roman emperor? Euangelion. But Paul, in the epistles, Pauline language, Paul picks up on that word and he takes it and he says, hey, I'm going to define gospel as the good news that God brought through Jesus, not the good news that a, 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 a letter deliverer brings from the emperor. Does that make sense? So Paul uses the word gospel different than it would have been used in secular Greek language. That's progressive revelation. God's word is, the word changes and as it changes, it's used in a particular way and it progresses through the Bible. But because the Bible is canonized, it's complete, we have the full what? Definition. But a biblical theologian is trying to understand its development in progression. Does that make sense? So when I'm studying a passage, some people, people are like, how'd you come up with that on Sunday morning? I'm giving all my secrets away. I'm convinced the Bible's the word of God. I'm convinced it's closed. I'm applying a right hermeneutic. I'm doing my exegetical work. And as I'm doing my exegetical work, I'm understanding the concepts as it's in the passage. And then as it's, I'm understanding the concept as it's in the passage, I'm understanding it to a broader degree as I'm thinking about how it fits into the whole Bible. Does that make sense? Then from biblical theology, we get to what? Systematic theology. Practical theology is how the systematics work out in our life which leads to Christian living. Now, I said earlier, everybody is a what? Theologian. You do all these things. You just didn't know the fancy words for it. Every time you read the Bible, you do all this. 
problem is, do you do it in the right order? And do you focus in on being careful about doing them rightly? You do. You're like, no, I don't. Do you interpret the Bible? Do you read it and say it means this? Yes. You're doing hermeneutics. Are you studying the Bible? All ladies, in our ladies Bible study, you guys are going through Titus. Guess what you're doing when you're getting together doing your uh, inductive Bible study? You're doing exegesis. And as you're there together at your tables, ladies, you're trying to understand a concept in the immediate passage and how it branches out. You've just done biblical theology. Then when you start thinking about how it fits in the whole Bible, you've moved on to systematics. And then by the time you leave the room, you're asking the question, how does this change the way that I live my life? You do this every single time you read the Bible, whether you knew it or not. I'm giving all the secrets away for pastors tonight. I'm going to be out of a job. All right. We got to jump through this last. I got 10 minutes left. So let me uh, browse through this. You're like, you did not, don't tell Dr. Marsh. I didn't even get into bibliology, all right? But in my defense, uh, in my defense, we have all this on the website. We've gone into detail of these, but I am gonna give you a, a, quick, uh, a quick overview, real quick, of bibliology in just a minute. So what are the divisions of systematic theology? You've heard these words before. So we start with what? There's an order here. There's 10 of them. Bibliology. Bibliology is what? What the Bible says about the Bible. The Bible says that it is the word of God. Check. My next question should be, who is this God? That is theology proper. It's called theology proper because everything that is comes from God. Because in him we live and move and have our being. So it's the foundational component is theology proper. So we start with the Bible's the word of God, bibliology. And then we organize everything the Bible says about God under the, and this is where you get the attributes of God and the holiness of God and the love of God and the mercy of God and all that stuff. Then you get to what? Who is God? Who is Christ? Christology. Then this is a fun word to say. Pneumatology. Pneumatology. Pneuma It's the Greek word for wind, and it's used to describe by Jesus, and in, in John in particular, who? The Holy Spirit. Pneumatology is what the whole Bible says about the Holy Spirit. Bibliology, theology proper, Christology, pneumatology, anthropology. What do you think that is? What the Bible says about you. This would be biblical roles of men and women. This would be marriage. This would be how the family unit should be ordered. Bible says all that stuff. That would be on the topic of anthropology. But with talking about people, we like to sing, and so we get into harmatology. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hamartiology, hamartia is the Greek word for sin. sin. So hamartia is the study of sin. Then we get into, so notice the progression. You see the progression in systematics? What is the Bible? Who is God? What, who is Christ? What did he do? What's the Holy Spirit? Who's man? What's sin? And then we get to salvation, soteriology. The study and the doctrine of what the whole Bible says about salvation. Then we get into angelology, angels. Ecclesiology, what the Bible says about the church. And eschatology, the study of end times things. Are you with me? Yes. All right, here we go. Don't have time for that. <laughs> Bibliology, here we go. I'm going to give it to you in a nutshell. Number one, when we talk about uh, bibliology, what categories are we going after? And again, I have a message on all of these subpoints for each of these subpoints on our website. If you can't find them, let me know. We'll get them to you if you're interested. I hope you are. These are important topics. First, inspiration of Scripture. The inspiration of Scripture uh, is defined as God superintended the human authors of the Bible so that they composed and recorded without error his message to mankind in the words of their original meaning. That comes from Charles Ryrie in his book, Basic Theology. The idea of inspiration is simple. It just literally means that the Bible comes from God. That's what it means. Now, there's a lot of complex arguments. There's reasons for that. But the reason we believe that is because, remember, bibliology is a study of what the Bible says about what? The Bible. Itself. And the Bible says 
2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness. All what? Scripture. Scripture is profitable. Now the word scripture, this is where, these are very important terms here for the inspiration of scripture. You often hear this. You'll hear theologians, conservative evangelical theologians say, when we talk about the inspiration of scripture, we'll say that scripture is verbally and plenary inspired. You ever heard that before? Verbal, meaning the words matter. That's what verbal means. And then the other word, plenary, means the totality. The words of the Bible are inspired by God, and the inspiration extends to every part of Scripture. It's plenary. Does that make sense? So Jesus says, not a jot or tittle, which is a, which is a little mark in writing Hebrew will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. So Jesus' view of inspiration is that in the original documents, even the smallest mark is God-breathed. So when we talk about the inspiration of Scripture, we're saying that what you hold in your hands, this canon in your hands, the, word, the Bible is a library. It's organized by type of literature, that's what it is. Some people, like, they're, they're new to this, and they're like, I want to read the Bible, so they start in Genesis. And they get, like, three chapters in, they're like, I can't do this. <laughs> or they get to Leviticus, they, they get through Genesis, they get through Exodus, then they find themselves in Leviticus, and they're like, what is going on here? I can't do this anymore. That's like going into a public library and starting at the first row of books and then trying to read everything in the whole library. It's a library. So you need to understand how this is organized. Every word is from God, but there's a bigger purpose to every word, and that is redemption through Jesus Christ. It's Christocentric is what we would say in theology. Does that make sense? So where should you start? I think a great place to start is Mark. Start with Jesus. What did he do? How did he do it? And that's a real short book. Second book, go to Ephesians. It's the gospel in a nutshell. I tell people, start there. It'll be real helpful. So God inspired, brought about this book, every word. Okay, next, here we go. Inerrancy. If this is God's word, it has to be what? Without error, because God does not err. Now, we can go into more on inerrancy, but it's a necessary view of Scripture. We don't have time to get in the details of inerrancy. There's a lot of complexities with inerrancy. It's also what? Clear. Anyone can understand this. You can. You can. It takes work sometimes, but you can understand this. It's clear. The reformers used to say it's perspicuous. We don't use that word anymore. When you hear the perspicuity of scripture, it just means it's clear. I like that movie Elf when he says the name Francisco and he says that's fun to say. That's why I like theology. There's just words that are fun to say. Like, well, I'm, I'm glad some of you appreciate my humor. If my wife were sitting in the front row right now, she'd be rolling her eyes. A couple of things that I'd like to just point out. God wants to be known. He's not playing a game of cosmic hide and seek. He wants you to know him. And I can say that with full authority and absolute confidence because that is exactly what scripture says about God's knowability. He wants you to know him. And he purposely chose to communicate to us in a way that we can intelligibly understand. There's a whole discipline on thinking through that. It's called anthropomorphic language. If God is spirit, does he speak English? Does he speak Spanish? Does he speak Arabic? Does he speak Chinese? Well, I guess he could, but he doesn't. So how does he communicate to us in a way that we can intelligibly understand, anthropomorphically? God wants to be understood. He's not hiding. That's what deism is. Deism is the idea that, you know, God started everything, but now he's just kind of removed from the world. We're not deists, we're what? Theists. What's the difference between deism and theism? Deism is that God started the world and he just removed himself. Theism is that God started the world and he's providentially here working through everything. He's sovereignly controlling all things, okay? Scripture is clear, but this is important to point. Can an unbeliever fully understand the Bible? 
He cannot. Why? Because he doesn't have the Holy Spirit. So this is important. Unbelievers, and I'll end quickly. You're like, you said that a minute ago, Ryan. Okay, ready for this? Unbelievers, we'll just, we'll close with having you turn one more place, even though I'm going to tell you a couple other things. But we'll just go to one more passage. Turn to 1 Corinthians 2. Second, or I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 2 says this. <laughs> Let's not tell Dr. Marsh I really didn't get the bibliology, all right? <laughs> Look at 2.14. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit. Natural meaning someone who's not born again. Someone who's not regenerate. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Uh, A biblical scholar by the name of Larry Pettigrew says this, an unbeliever can understand scripture only uh, on an external level. That's because truth is spiritually what? Discerned. Okay, you've heard. So we're fortunate. Not every church has a Corey Marsh. Dr. Corey Marsh, he is a full-time seminary professor. He's a member of our church. He's a great resource for us. But a lot of people don't understand what Corey does interacts with. And this is why Corey's ministry is so special. There's a whole group, hundreds and thousands of them, of not hundreds of thousands, but thousands of them, of what we would call critical or liberal scholars. Now, when we talk about liberal scholarship and conservative scholarship, we're not talking Republicans and Democrats. We're not talking political liberalism and political conservatism. Liberal scholars are a group of people that spend, they have PhDs, they have more degrees than Fahrenheit, and they spend their life trying to understand the Bible without the Holy Spirit. We call them liberal scholars because they reject that the Bible is the Word of God. They understand things at an external level, but they don't have the internal witness of the Holy Spirit. So in scholarship, we say conservative theologians would be the ones that believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. Does that make sense? So Corey spends most of his time interacting, besides teaching at the seminary level, interacting and writing papers combating liberal scholarship. People that also have PhDs that are studying the Bible only from an external perspective. Are you with me? So when you hear liberal scholarship or conservative scholarship and evangelicalism, that's what that means. So look back at the text with me. We looked at an unbeliever's comprehension, but notice the believer's comprehension. But he, verse 15, who is spiritual, what? Appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? Answer, but we have the mind of Christ. We've been born again. We've, God has made us spiritually alive and he has put his spirit in us. So if you're a Christian, you what? You crave the milk of the word. Now, listen, if you're like me, a confession time. I know you want to go home, but I'm going to confess right now. I was the world's worst student in high school. Not even kidding. Barely graduated. Could not get into a good college. That's pretty much why I joined the Marine Corps when I was 18. Because I went to a semester of college and I just could not hack it. So I just want to shoot guns, blow stuff up, and travel the world. But listen, I want you to understand something. There's, why do Christians become readers? Why do Christians start doing all this stuff? It's because internally we have been awakened. We've come alive to God. And we want to know him. And so what happens is Like a newborn baby craves milk, we crave the word of God. Man does not live on bread alone, but on what? Every word of God. But the more you want to know him, guess what you got to come to terms with? Yes, there's an internal reality in studying scripture, but there is also a what? An external reality. 
because God has chosen to reveal himself in our world in a way that humans can intelligibly understand. Do you have to be a Christian to understand how to do these things? No, there's a whole group of people called liberal theologians that aren't Christians that understand how to interact with this stuff. You see, but what we do as evangelical Christians, I hear this criticism all the time. Man, I love your church. I learn so much when I'm there, but it's too cerebral for me. Really? Doesn't the Bible say they're supposed to worship God not only with all of our hearts, but with all of our minds? Because remember, we're dealing with the transcendent. The reason why this D student in high school, now I'm I'm not out of school. I don't think I'll ever be out of school. It's because I want to be a workman who is not ashamed and rightly handles the word of truth. Do you believe the Bible is the word of truth? Is the Holy Spirit pressing you into relationship deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper with him through his word? Then why would you not apply yourself to understanding and interacting with scripture in a precise way? Because as Dr. Marsh has already so aptly pointed out, what's the whole point of Bible study? Knowing God. That's the whole point. We want to know this God who loved us so perfectly in Jesus Christ. I want to know him. So if you're here tonight and this is just like totally difficult, it was for me too. But you won't stop. You won't. Because the spirit of God is in you and you're going to want to know more and more and more, and it never stops. So we hope this has been helpful. But can I give you the whole bibliology, at least so I could say that I did it? (laughs) Here we go. Inspiration, inerrancy, clarity. Uh, Fourth, authority. Sufficiency. Oh man, I wish I had an hour to preach on sufficiency. (laughs) You're like, let us go home. I'm gonna say one thing. To say that the Bible is sufficient is to say that it has all you need for life and godliness. That's how Peter says it. You want a better marriage? Where do you go? You want to know how to handle finances rightly? Where do you go? The Bible. You want to know how to treat people? Where do you go? You want to know how God expects to be worshiped and sang to? Where do you go? You want to know how God talks to you? Where do you go? You want to learn how to raise kids? Where do you go? It is sufficient. He loves you so much. He loves you so much. He's given you everything. He's given you everything for your life right here. This is not just basic instructions before leaving earth. Have you ever heard that before? It's all sufficient. It is instructions before leaving earth, but it also contains everything you need to know to glorify him. The Bible, fifth or fourth, is authoritative. Fifth, it's sufficient. Two more, here we go. Or last one, and God will preserve it until the end of all things. Not a single jot or tittle will be undone until the end of all things.